This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Free. This is a Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Ryan Graves. What did you think of the new Top Gun movie? How accurate was it? Let's start there. I thought the flying was really accurate. I thought the the type of flying they did and how they approached the actual mission, um, of course, had a lot of liberties. But one thing that seems to be hard to capture on these types of things are the the chess game that's going on while that type of flying is happening. The chess game between, like in a dogfight, between the, 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 the pilots and the enemy, or between the different pilots? I'll even speak to just that particular mission they flew there. And for that particular mission, it's kind of a, a chess game with yourself to, to get everything in place. So what kind of flight they flew is called a, a high threat scenario, which means they uh, have to ingress low due to uh, the surface to air threats, the integrated air defense systems that are nearby. And they have to ingress low and pop up like we see in the movie. And in that particular movie, that was a pre-planned strike. They knew exactly where they were going. But there's a scenario where we have to operate in that type of environment and we don't know exactly where we're going to strike or we're going to be adapting to real-time targets. And so in that scenario, you would have one of those fighters down low like that operating as a mission commander, as a forward air controller. And he's out there calling shots joining on those other players in order to ensure they're pointed at the right target. So so that's a bit of the chess game that he'll be playing. Can you actually describe for people who haven't seen the movie uh, what the mission actually is? Yeah. What's involved in the mission? So in this particular mission, it, it's kind of what we would call a pre-planned strike. So there's a known location that's in a heavily defended area. Uh, and the air crew... First, the air threats. What does ingress mean? Ingress means that they're going to be pushing from a start location towards the target or the objective. So there's an ingress portion of the mission and an egress portion of the mission. Oh, (laughs) okay. Uh, Like the entrance and the exit type of thing. Got it. But it changes our mindset tactically quite a bit, right? Because when we're entering someplace, we have the option to enter. But when we go drop a bomb on location, we're exiting. that force them to have to fly low. Is that a realistic thing? It is realistic. So driving those aircraft in the clutter, uh, you know, all radar systems, or most I should say, are essentially line of sight. And so they're gonna be limited by the horizon or any clutter out there. And even a number of radars, if they are located up high and looking down towards that aircraft, um, the clutter, all the the objects such as trees and canyons, can have effect on radar systems. And so it can be a type of camouflage. So that's a camouflage for the radar, but what about the surface air missile? Is that is that a legitimate way to, <laughs> to avoid missiles? You can look through anything. So there is always gonna be the ability to mask yourself, um, but with a larger number of assets and distributed communication networks, where those radars are looking makes all the difference. And I said they were ingressing past an IAS, and that's an integrated air defense system. And that linking of uh, air defense systems is what makes it um, so hard, so complicated, is that the sensors and the weapons are disassociated from each other so that if you took out the target that was shooting at you, it still has the ability to, um, to intercept you from another radar location. So it's distributed and it, it's stronger that way. You mean the, the... A lot of those systems might be a little bit more ghetto, if I can use that technical term. Like um, I've, I've gotten the uh, ad hoc maybe is the, uh, is, <laughs> is the, is the <laughs> I don't know. But I, you know, having uh, just recently visited Ukraine and seen a lot of aspects of the way that war is fought, 
there's a lot of improvised type of systems. So you take high, uh, high tech, like advanced technology, but the way you deploy it and the way you organize it is very improvised and ad hoc and is responding to the uncertainty in the dynamic environment. And so from an enemy perspective or whoever is trying to deal with that kind of system, it's hard to figure it out because uh, it's like me, I played tennis for a long time and it's always easier to play, this is true for all sports, uh, play tennis against a good tennis player. We're really well organized uh, and so you could plan. And there was a very nice ravine that went right down the middle of them. <laughs> That's how <laughs> movies work, isn't it? Yeah. But <laughs> okay. no, I, I absolutely agree. So, you know, um, what you say is a, is a very good point. And as you know, if we were to take a, a, a chunk of airspace and break it up into little bits, you know, there'd be places that are better to fly or, or less, less good to fly. Um, and, you know, we are seeing that now with what they call manned on man teaming. Uh, we see tactical aircraft or, you know, some type of aircraft or platform. Uh, mission planning that allows the air crew to act more as a, a mission planner, uh, mission commander versus having to just pick the right assets or fly them around and, or manipulate them um, somewhat physically. So actually going back to the chess thing, can you elaborate on what you mean the, playing a game of chess with yourself? What's, when you're flying that mission, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, there's a few people you're usually fighting against in the air, you know, there's the bad guys and then there's uh, physics and, and mother nature, right? So um, when we're down at about a hundred feet, um, it's a chess game to stay alive for the pilot and it's a chess game for the Wizzo to, process the information he needs and then communicate it to all those other aircraft that were flying around to ensure that they're putting their weapons on the right target. What's the Wizzo? Wizzo is a weapon systems officer. He's a backseater who is not a pilot, but they're responsible for radar manipulation and, and communications and uh, weapons deployments of certain natures. So the, the chess game is against physics, against the enemy. Uh, time. Time, what about your own? Psychology, fear, uncertainty. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no time for that type of self-reflection okay. while we're flying. Um, and to have a level of, of randomness or at least appearance of randomness due to the complexity, you know, I would, I would consider it like a stochastic uh, tactical advantage because even our own blue fighters wouldn't be able to engage in that fight because it would, it would be unsafe essentially for anything else. Uh, and, and I think that's where we have to drive to because otherwise it's always this chicken and mouse cat game about whose tactics and who knows what. But if knowledge is no longer a factor, um, it's going to make things a lot different. That's really interesting. So out of the many things uh, that are part of your expertise, your your journey. You're also working on, on uh, autonomous and semi-autonomous systems, the use of AI and machine learning and man-on-man uh, -man teaming, all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about it. Uh, but you're saying sort of when people think about the use of AI in war, in military systems, they think about like computer vision for... <laughs> for human operators to respond to. Exactly. That's really interesting. Okay, so <laughs> back back to Tom Cruise and Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> what about the dogfighting? Uh, what aspects of that were accurate? So dogfighting is kind of uh, an interesting um, conversation because it's not the most tactically relevant skill set nowadays uh, by traditional standards because the, the ranges with which we engage and employ weapons are very uh significant uh and so if we're in a scenario where we're in a dog fight like that um a lot of things have probably gone wrong right and that's kind of how this mission was set up right it was a you know a no win type scenario most likely um and so for a dog fight the aircraft size and the ranges and the turn radiuses make it so it's not very theatrical right the aircraft looks small and while it's intense with the systems i have and the sensors and what i'm feeling and all that if I, you know, we've done it and we've done it, right? We take video of that and it's just like a blue sky and you see a little dot out there. So not very interesting. And so 
anytime it really looks interesting in dogfight arena, um, that's most likely uh, fiction because we really only get close for you know a millisecond as we're zipping past each other at the merge. You're breaking my heart, right? I know, You're breaking sorry. my heart. <laughs> No, I, I understand. In a dog fight, you can go and have fun, but you know, in a dog fight specifically. Maybe that was more common in the earlier wars, the World War II and, and before that, where the is is it due to the sort of the range and the effectiveness of the weapon systems involved, basically, Correct. and the accuracy of the targeting systems at range. But there's also a train of thought um, that hasn't necessarily been tested out yet, which is with the advent of. Um, advanced electronic warfare, EW, uh, and or uh, unmanned assets, the battle space may get so complex and missiles uh, may essentially just get uh, dropped out of the sky or wasted such that you're going to be in close with either IR missiles or guns uh, if it's a no kidding, um, you know, must defend type scenario. First of all, what's electronic warfare? You know, it's basically trying to get control of electromagnetic spectrum um, for the interest of um, whatever operation is going on. So in the tactical environment, a lot of that is trying to deceive the radar or can we deceive the missile or just, you know, stop their guidance, things of that nature. Man, it's a battle in the space of information, of digital information. Yeah, that, well, F-22 and F-35, right? F-22 is a big, expensive aircraft and it was made to be a great fighter. Uh, but the F-35... F-14 Tomcat type fighter or or maybe P-51 type aircraft. But the F-35 is maybe not the best dog fighter, but it doesn't have to get in a dog fight, right? It's like how you'd be the best knife fighters, not getting a knife fight sometimes. Lockheed Martin. was good at because it had to be heavier to land on the aircraft carrier. We had to give it extra bulk. But... It also needed special mechanisms to slow down enough to land on aircraft carrier. And so it made it very maneuverable. And what that leads to a lot of times, the ability to get maybe the first shot uh, in a fight, um, which is very good. But if you do make that sharp turn, you're going to bleed a lot of your energy away and be more susceptible for follow-on shots if that one's less susceptible. And so there's this kind of aggression, non-aggression game you can play depending on the type of aircraft you're fighting. Where does the F-35 land on that spectrum? The F-35 land somewhere behind the F-22s. So <laughs> there'll probably be a row of F-22s or F-18s, and F-35 will be out back, but it'll be enabling a lot of the warfare that's happening in front of Is it one of the more expensive planes because of all the stuff on it? It certainly is, yeah. In the movie, they have Tom Cruise. How tough does it get? I'm just gonna call out the the BS of ejecting at Mach 10, just for the record, because in is, the movie, uh, yeah. there's been, I think, at least one ejection that was supersonic. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, it was not pretty, but he survived. Um, so there would have to be some interesting mechanisms to eject successfully at Mach 10, but I'll digress on that for the moment. Yeah, that seemed very strange. And he just walked away from it. But anyway, so, you know. He's, he seemed disheveled. <laughs> <laughs> the speed limit on the highway you don't really notice anything um when, to cross that at least in f-18 because we have a lot more weight than most fighters is typically we'll do that in a descent uh, and we'll do that a full afterburner uh, just dumping gas into the engine um, and so that'll get us over the fastest i think i've gone was about 1.28 uh, but what's interesting people don't realize is that if i take that throttle and i'm an afterburner and i just bring it back and i'm just bring it back to mill, which is full power, just not afterburner. The deacceleration is so strong due to the air friction that it throw you forward in your straps. Almost, you know, I would say, you know, maybe like 70% as strong almost as, as trapping on the boat. It's pretty strong. Um, so it's almost like a reverse car crash just for the deacceleration. So the acceleration, you know, is usually kind of slow and you don't feel anything, of course, when you're crossing through it. But the deacceleration is pretty violent. The deceleration is violent, huh? Okay. Uh, but is there is there a fundamental difference between like Mach 1 and hypersonic Mach 5 and so on? Does it require yeah. like super special training? And is that something that's used often in warfare? Is that not really that No, necessary? so hypersonic human flight, in if it exists, is not something that's employed tactically in, um, in any sense right now that I'm aware. 
data linking capabilities we have, um, it's less of, you know, it's a more of a integrated picture, I'll say. Um, and so the hypersonics um, are really... <laughs> Uh, locating a target and identifying it and, you know, essentially authorizing its destruction by whatever means, uh, employing, and then actually following up to ensure that you did what you said you were going to do in some sense, right? Does it need another reattack, something of that nature? And so there's an old dogfighting framework, you could call it, it's called the OODA loop, uh, kind of made its way in the engineering of business now, but the old observe, orientate, decide, act was initially a, a fighter mechanism in order to get inside that kill chain of your opponent and break it up so that he can't uh, process his, his kill chain on you. Mm -hmm. And so hypersonics are a way of shortening those those windows of opportunity to to react to that. I wondered to what do, like uh, how much do you have to shorten it in order for the defense systems not to work anymore? It seems like uh, it's very, you know, I, I'm both often horrified by the thought of nuclear war, uh, but at the same time, wonder what that looks like. States by missile with the defense systems. Or the defense, system. defense systems. But then again, I also understand that these are extremely complicated systems, the amount of integration required. And because you're not using them, I mean, this is... <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> there could be, you know, there's like an intern somewhere uh, that like forgot to update the code, the Fortran code that like is going to be make the difference because you, you don't have the opportunity to really thoroughly test, um, which is, is really scary. Of course, the systems are probably incredible if they could be tested, but because they can't be really thoroughly tested in actual, um, in an actual attack, I wonder. I mean, the, I guess one assumption there would be that these hypersonic missiles would only be launched in the case of an attack. Yeah, it's a serious. And it issue. damaged the, the the engine, and they made it seem like it's a serious, exactly a serious issue. I've hit birds. Um, I've I know someone that took a turkey vulture to the face mm -hmm. through the cockpit, right? Shattered the cockpit, knocked them out. Um, I think the. It actually, I don't know him personally, but it was a story I know from uh, the command I was at. And um, I believe the back seater had to punch out uh, and punch them both out because he was unconscious, you know, in the front seat from the bird. Um, it can kill you from hitting you. It's, you know, it's like a bowling ball going 250 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it can take out an engine. You can go in the... Um, Certain bases you have to call up and they'll tell you what it is for the day or for that hour and other ones have it in like their, their weather report that goes out over the radio. What are some technological solutions to this? Or is this just uh, because it's a low probability event, there's no real solution for it? I would say it's not a low probability event. I mean, this is happening a lot. I mean, although the hits themselves aren't necessarily that common, or I'll say a catastrophic hit, either a near miss or a hit or the pilot having to actively maneuver to avoid it is pretty common. And in fact, it, it seems stressful. <laughs> it is. It's so common, in fact, that. So is that one of the more absurd things, challenges you have to deal with in flying? Is there other things sort of maybe weather conditions like harsh weather conditions, is there something that we maybe don't often think about in terms of the challenges of flying? Birds, in a way, aren't a ridiculous threat for us. It's it's a safety threat that, you know, anything physical in the air is something that we really have to be careful about, whether we're flying formation off of the aircraft right next to us or whether uh, it's a turkey vulture at 2,000 <laughs> feet or a flock of 5,000 birds, like, at yeah. the runway, and we have to wave off, you know? and Although they're low probability, a lot of bases will have like actual environmental protection agency employees that are responsible for safely removing migratory birds or different animals um, that may be in the runways or flying about. Wow. I didn't know what a turkey vulture is, and it really does look like a mix between a vulture and a turkey. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. <laughs> and, and look kind of dumb. No offense to turkey vultures. Um 
in that movie, who was the enemy nation? <laughs> was, uh, it, was it? Uh, I mean, I, I think I guess they were implying it's Iran, or or is it Russia? I didn't think they were implying any particular nation state. Frankly, I think they did a somewhat decent job of having some ambiguous fifth generation fighters. Um, the location and and the stockpile, like I, I get like how the story kind of insinuates certain things, but they seem to do a good job of not having anything directly pointing to another nation, which I thought was you know the good move. I I enjoy these type of movies as an aviator and you know as an American, right? Because it's a feel good movie, but um, you know we we shouldn't be celebrating going to war with any particular country. You know China, Russia, whoever may have these weapons. It's it's fun to watch, but it would be an incredibly serious event to be employing these weapons. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about war in general because yeah, it's the the movie is kind of celebrating the 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 human side of things and also the incredible technology involved, but. There's also the cost of uh, of war and the seriousness of war and the suffering involved with war, not just in the fighting, but in the death of civilians and all those kinds of things. Um, well, you were a Navy pilot. Let's let's talk a little bit more uh, seriously about this. And you were twice deployed in the Middle East, flying the F A eighteen F Super Hornet. Can you briefly tell the story of your career as a Navy pilot? Sure. So I joined the Navy in 2009, right after college. I went to officer, essentially the officer boot camp, officer candidate school. Uh, I applied as a pilot and I got in as a pilot. That was the advantage of going that way is that I could essentially choose what I wanted. And if I got in, great. If not, I didn't get stuck doing something else. So you knew you wanted to be a pilot? I did. I joined, I went through my initial training. I went through primary flight training that all aviators go through. Uh, and I did well enough that, um, you know, one of the first lessons they teach you in the Navy is that, um, you know, you can have a great career in the Navy and you can, you know, see the world and do what you want. But at the end of the day, it's all about the needs of the Navy and what they need. So, you know, they may not have the platform you like, or, you know, you may not necessarily get to choose your own own adventure here. But uh, I was lucky enough that there was one jet slot in my class and I was uh, lucky enough, fortunate enough to get it. So was a jet slot. So, well, yeah, what that means is that I was assigned actually tail hook at that point, which meant I would go train t- to fly aircraft that land on aircraft carriers. C2 mail truck? <laughs> yeah. What's that? C2 basically so brings all the mail. They, they, no, they literally on bring the, the shore, mail. and they're the ones that bring supplies to the ship via air and people. Sorry if I missed it. Is it a plane or is it a helicopter? It's a plane. Okay. All right. And the F-18 is a fighter jet. Correct. Okay. So I selected tail hook, which meant I could get one of those other ones, but 80% of them or so are jets. So I was in a good spot at that point. And that's when I went to Murdy, Mississippi to fly my first jet, which was the T-45 Goshawk. Cool. So uh, what kind of plane is that? Is that, a, is that, that's what you were doing your training on? That's the jet aircraft you get in before you actually go to the F-18. It is uh, carrier capable. So go to the boat for the first time in it during the day, drop uh, fake bombs, do dog fighting, um, low levels, formation flying day and night. Well, it's a pretty plane. And, yeah, and it looks like a cone so that no one hits it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's usually not used for fighting, it's used for training? It's used for training how to fight. Got it. So what what was that like? Was that the first time you were sort of, really getting into it yeah that was really interesting because before that it was a 600 horsepower prop plane and going from that to the t-45 is one of like the biggest jumps in power and like navy you know machine operation how Um, much horsepower does the t-45 have approximately like fifteen thousand or so so it's a huge jump from 600 you said horsepower about cool so it's a big big leap Mm mm-hmm but it's a jet, you know, so it, it performs differently. It's faster, right? And what that means, not just because it's faster, your whole mind needs to be faster. Everything happens faster in the air now, right? Yeah. Those comms happen faster. Um, your landing gear has to come up faster. Everything just happens faster in a jet. And so it's a big jump. Uh, and I'll never forget going on my first flight in that aircraft. Um, it was a formation flight for someone else. And I was just in the back watching and there was an instructor in the flight. 
And so what that means is instructors in a single aircraft, and then there's three or four other aircraft, and they're learning how to do joins, and they're learning how to fly in formation. And as a new student in the back, it's amazing, right? Because, you know, photo op time and all this, like I'm seeing aircraft up close for the first time. It's awesome. Um, and on the way back, um, we couldn't get our landing gear down, uh, ironically. Uh, so... Well, because I, I, that yeah. to me is pretty exciting. <laughs> so that, I mean, how, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, I mean, that must be terrifying, like uh, early on in your career. Probably just too dumb to realize the significance of it. Because as a new student, you know, not really appreciating, you know, just what is ahead of me if we are ejecting. Um, okay. But at the time, it was more, it was just like rote, right? Because I was back there and then I went from a observer mode to a, I'm going to provide you the help that I can provide you as a member of this crew, you know, mode. And so it was less about, I'm, you know, on this 20 mile trip and thinking about my, um, how vulnerable I am, you know, we're going through checklists, we're talking to people, we're getting ready. So no, it wasn't, it wasn't fearful. And the whole time we were doing one of these to try to get the, uh, the What's uh, one of gear these? down. So we're oh, unloading the jet and then loading it back to try to get yeah. the gear out with the stick. And, um, and it came down, it came down halfway. For investigating mishaps. And a uh, a student went in and he, he went in the back seat of a form flight, just like the one I went on. Uh, and he went out and he ended up ejecting on that flight. The exact same type of flight. Uh, they went out and they had a, a runaway trim scenario and it caused the aircraft essentially just to invert itself almost 180 degrees uh, at about 600 feet over the ground. And they punched out just slightly outside the ejection window at about 300, 400 feet or so, but they were completely fine. Um, so, you know, and then about two months later, we had another ejection. And about three months after that, we had another ejection. So um, unfortunately, you know, it can, it can be more common than people think. What does it feel like to get ejected? Thankfully, I don't know. I can oh, describe never, it to you. I can sense. tell you what it's like from what I've heard, but I truly think it's one of those things that you just don't understand until it happens. Uh, it's like instantaneous, about 250 Gs, which is only... Just this, um, if you do, you know, who knows where you wake up. Um, you know, you could be in a tree, you could still be falling. Uh, you can be in the water, so. The physics of that is fascinating, how to eject safely. Do you know the story about how that was tested at all? No. I don't know the full story, but uh, there was an I'm airport. guessing nobody knows the full story. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> a lot of shady stuff going on. But anyway, uh, you mean like in the early, early days, or? They took a flight dock up to a rocket sled and just see how much their body could take it. Uh. And he yeah. turned a lot of his body in the in the mush in the in the process of getting that science done, but he saved a lot of lives. People used used to be tougher back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> That's how science used to be done. Um, so, how did your training continue? So, how take me take me farther through your career uh, as you work towards graduating towards the F-18s? So. In Flying in, in a, that's what you mean by formation. Mm -hmm. So literally having an awareness. Right, is this done for you or are you as a human supposed to understand like where you are in the formation, how to maintain formation, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, or this is, is a, it done autonomously or manually? There's a great autonomy point on the end of this I've thought about. So, but what we do, it's all manual. And so I'm looking at his wing and I'm looking at um, different visual checkpoints that form like a triangle, right? Like an equal out triangle, essentially. And then as that triangle, you know, is no longer equal, I can tell my relative position against that aircraft, right? Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, yeah. And so that's what I'm staring at for sometimes hours on end, you know, several feet away, doing one of these if I'm in the weather, that's all it is. So you get, it's almost like, is it peripheral vision or is it your- No, we're staring vision? directly at it. The <laughs> peripheral is coming on my, on my, um, that's interesting stuff right my sensors yeah. and my, yeah. all my instruments and so he is my gyroscope at that point right while wow, you're flying not looking straight correct i'm fly like this for 
hours. It can hurt your neck. We don't like doing this as much. Uh, and I don't think it's just me, right? It's a weird thing where when you're like this, it's actually harder to fly formation slightly than here because being in line of your hand movements and of the aircraft somehow has an effect on our ability to be more yeah. precise and comfortable. It's strange. Uh, yeah. So, but so the, the, there's a sym symmetry to the formation usually. So one of the people on the other side really don't like being on that side. Is it, is it, does it, who gets like the short straw? To, <laughs> how do you decide which side of the formation you are? And that's his wingman essentially. And then in a division, there's two other aircraft. And then you have another senior flight leader, that's the dash three position. And then you have dash four, the last one. And if you are all lined up on one side, like fingertip, um, one, two, three, four, that dash four guy is gonna be at the end of that whip. So if you're flying formation, each one's making you know movements relative to the lead, dash four is kind of you know at the end of that error. You know, and so his movements are kind of like a whip. It's very difficult to fly in that position in close. Can you elaborate? Is it because of the air, the air dynamics? So, so what's a whip? If this is the flight lead and this is dash two, yep. flight lead is rock steady and just doing his thing. Yeah, flight two is going to be working that triangle, moving a little bit, right? Oh, and it. he has this small air bubble that he's doing his best to stay. And then, but dash yep. three is flying off dash two. And so yep. his air bubble is dash two's plus his own. And okay, dash so four, it gets more and more stressful as you get farther up. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, what's the experience of that staring for long periods of time and trying to maintain formation? Mm -hmm. How stressful is that? Because like, you know, we're doing that when we drive, staying in lane. And that becomes, after you get pretty good at it, it becomes somewhat, it's still stressful. Mm -hmm. um, which actually is surprisingly stressful when you look at, like lane keeping systems, they actually relieve that stress somehow, and it's actually creates a much more pleasant experience while you're still able to maintain situational awareness and like stay awake, which is really interesting. Like, I don't think people realize how stressful it is to lane keep when they drive. So this is even more stressful. So are you, do you, do you think about that? Or is this, um, yeah, I guess how stressful is it for me? right? That's when it's very stressful because you have to be very close in order to maintain visual. And you might be in a thunderstorm, right? Uh, and so you have to be very tight. You might start raining um, and then he's turning, but you might not even <laughs> where you are in the world starts getting very confused and you immediately get this, this sense of it. It's weird. Like I look at the HUD and it, feels all my sensors are telling me it's spinning, but it's not, you know? And so I have to trust my instruments, even though it feels like it's spinning. And the same thing can happen when you're flying formation off of someone and it, it can be very, um, very dangerous and um, disorientating. But the point is to try to regain awareness by trusting the instruments, like, uh, like distrust all your human senses and just use the instruments to rebuild situational awareness. Not in this particular case, because our situational awareness is based, it's predicated off of our flight lead. So in a sense, I'm just trusting his movements. And so he's my gyroscope, but you're absolutely right. And if I was by myself, I would trust my instruments, but I can't just stop flying form and trust my instruments because now I'm gonna hit him. Oh yeah, you have to pay attention yeah. to him. So he's my reference. So the instruments are not helping you significantly with his positioning. Not, it's all completely manual. So uh, uh, is there a future where some of that is autonomous? Yeah, and I've thought about au automating that flight um, regime. But when I started thinking about it, uh, I you know realized that all the formation keeping that we do uh, is designed to enhance the uh, aviators. Uh, around. Uh, airports, but when we consider flying in a, or formation in a tactical environment, we can be much more effective with non-traditional formation keeping or perhaps no formation keeping perhaps. So autonomy used for formation keeping, not for convenience, but for the introduction of randomness that's Linked hard to- a real-time mission planner, yeah. Right. And then that's where you also have some human modifications. So it's like manned, unmanned teaming enters that picture. So you use some of the 
um, human intuition and adjustment of this formation. The formation itself has some uncertainty. I mean, it's such an interesting dance. I think that is the most fascinating application of artificial intelligence is when it's human AI collaboration, that that semi-autonomous dance that you see in these semi-autonomous vehicle systems uh, in terms of cars being uh, driving, but also in the... I mean, in a split second, you have to make all these kinds of decisions and it feels like an AI system can do as much harm as it can help. And so to get that right uh, is a really fascinating challenge. One of the challenges too, isn't just the, the algorithms of the autonomy itself, but how it senses the environment. Uh, that of course is gonna what, be what all these decisions are based off of. And that's a challenge in, in this type of environment. Well, I gotta ask, so uh, F-18, what's it like to fly a fighter jet as best? I mean, what to you is beautiful, powerful, what do you? You know, looking down at the earth from upside down, you know, I, I came to love that, and but it wasn't necessarily the passion that drove me there. I just had no exposure to that. The only expo the exposure I had was was reading and, and going in the woods and, and science fiction and, and all that. And so, you know, what seemed to kind of drive me towards that was just, a desire to really be operating as close to what I thought was the edge of technology or science. And that's the path that I chose to try to get close to that. I thought that being in a, in a fighter jet uh, and you know all the tools and the technology and the knowledge and the challenges and the you know failures and victories that were followed. So you sort of, one is the man mastery over the machine. And second is the machine is like the greatest thing that humans have ever created, arguably. The the like things that Lockheed Martin and others have built. I mean, the engineering in that. Yeah. It's, um, however you feel about war, which is one of the sad things about human civilization is um, war inspires the engineering of tools that are, incredible and it's like maybe without war if we look at human history we would not build some of the incredible things we built so in order to win wars to stop wars we build these incredible systems that perhaps propagate war and that's a that's another discussion i'll ask you about but this to you this is like um this is a chance to experience the greatest engineering humans have ever been able to do. Like similar, I suppose, that astronauts feel like when they're flying. And I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to take that route. Uh, I was gonna apply to test pilot school. Um, it, it just didn't work out for me. Uh, I ended up having a broken foot during my window. But long story short, I ended up after uh, my time in my fleet squadron, and we can get back to the rest of the timeline if you want, but uh, I went to be uh, an instructor pilot um instead right and then you know i i was talking about this with a squadron mate earlier today about how you know i certainly wouldn't be talking with lex today if i ended up going to test pilot school I, you know i was that i never would have i would never would have had the i would have maybe, uh, maybe recklessness i don't know but the the willingness to have a conversation about uap while i was you know I, that led me to the decision to get out once I went there. And it it, it gave, kind of enabled me to talk about UAP more publicly. Uh, and if I stayed in the Navy, then I, I don't think that would have happened. I wouldn't have been able to if I went that route. If you asked me that five years ago, I would have said, yes, I want to. In fact, I would like to die on Mars. Um, now, today. now I have some hesitations and I have some hesitations because I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic. And I think that, you know, I think that we are truly like on the brink of a, of a very wide technological revolution that's going to kind of move us how we used to move information and data in, in this last century 
we're going to be manipulating and managing matter in that next century. And so I think that I think our reach as human as humans are going to get a lot wider, a lot faster than people may realize, or at least. Wait, are you getting like super ambitious beyond Mars? Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like Mars seems kind of boring. But I want to go beyond that. Is that what? what do you, do you mean the reach of humanity across all kinds of technologies, or do you mean literally across space? Across space, you know. So you know, we're gonna be. I think that as artificial intelligence and machine learning start broaching further into the the topic of science, the area of science, and we start working through new physics, we start working through, or I should say, past the Einsteinian frameworks, um, as we kind of get a better idea of what space time is or isn't. <laughs> Uh, we may have, we may find, you know, answers that we didn't know that we were looking for, and we may have more opportunity. And I'm not saying this is something I'm, you know, betting the farm on, of course, but um, maybe, maybe that's a road I want to explore on Earth instead of uh, on Mars. I, maybe there's technology that can be brought to bear with new science and harder engineering that is a road that doesn't go past Mars to get outside the solar system. So there's different ways to explore the universe than, so. than the the traditional rocket systems. Uh, if we can continue sort of your journey, um, you said what, that that you were attracted to the the incredibly advanced technologies of the F twenty uh, of the F eighteens and just the the fighter jets in general. On a carrier. We're taking off from a carrier and landing on a carrier. So what's that like? What are the challenges of that? Taking off is pretty easy. It's procedurally somewhat complex where there's a lot of moving parts, almost like a clock. You know, you're almost in a pocket watch so sense and you're a part of the machinery. And so long as you press the right buttons and do the right things, then you're going to go shooting off the front. So there's like a checklist to follow and there's several people involved in that checklist and you just got to follow the checklist correctly. Essentially, yep. Lots of ways to screw it up, but you'll know how to screw it up. Uh, but landing on the back of the boat is a whole different animal. Um, there's a lot more variables. Um, there's essentially one or two people responsible for the success of that. Um, the landing signal officer, who actually represents a team of specially trained aviators who are responsible for helping that aviator land on the boat, and uh, the pilot himself. and it, it is a hard task to actually fly precisely enough to be good at it. So to fly, quote unquote, the perfect pass, you essentially have to fly your head through a one foot by one foot box. That's essentially the target you're shooting for. Um, plus or minus probably about five knots on airspeed, although we don't really judge it by airspeed. It's something called angle of attack, uh, but generally, you know, pretty tight parameters there. Um, and you can do everything perfect and still fail, right? So when we go to touchdown, we immediately bring the power up and we rotate as if we were doing, uh, as if we were bouncing off the deck. And if we catch it, then we slow down. Uh, and then someone tells us to bring the power back, which we do. We don't do it on our own because mm -hmm. uh, it's such a violent experience. Um, you can think you're trapped or not, or something breaks and you you bring your throttle back. And that's a very serious thing. It happened to the best of us. You know, I'll admit I've done it once. When I first got to the squadron, um, it's called Ease Guns Land. Uh, and so, you know, I came in the boat and I brought the power, I cracked the power back a little bit before I had been told to her that my aircraft had finished settling in. And that was a big faux pas, right? So, especially as a new guy. So um, it's, it's a very serious business. There's a lot of eyes on you and there's a lot of ways to screw it up. But the physical, you know, rush of like having a great pass and then like there's just a like the crash of into the boat and all that, the physical sensation from it, you know, when everything's going great, you know, it's top of the world, it's a great feeling. How much of it is feel? How much of it is um, instruments? How much? You know, I see that ball rise, I see the ball low. It's a lagging indicator though, right? Mm -hmm. And your jet is a, a, a lagging engine too, right? It takes time to spool up the engine. So that adds to the complexity, you have to think ahead a bit. Um, you know, so you don't want to, um, to, you can't just bring the power up and leave it there. You have to bring the power up, touch it, bring it back. 
Uh, and oh, by the way, your landing area is moving not just away from you, but also on an angle, right? Because we have an angled deck. And so you're constantly doing one of these to correct yourself as you that go. Seems so stressful. And even every time you do one of those, yeah. maybe it's a 30 degree, degree angle bank, right? I'm losing lift, right? Yeah. And so I have to compensate with power each time I do that. So I'm doing another one of those. Because you have to maintain um, the same level you're always lowering. Like, it's a constant rate of descent that's increasing from about 200 feet per minute to about 650. And every time you do this, that's messing with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to compensate. And you're doing that manually. Do that manually. Yep. All right. And then, of course, as you come down that glide slope, uh, it becomes more and more narrow. And you have to, of course, um, modulate your inputs such that they're smaller and smaller because they have a bigger and bigger effect as you get closer in. Um, and what happens too when you get in close is that right before you cross over, if this is the boat right here, your table, right before you kind of get your wings over the boat itself, this big wind from the the main tower of the boat is where it dips down. So the wind actually. Was yeah, that was the uh, head landing signal officer for for my squadron. So you you've probably seen some tough landings. <laughs> I have. Uh, I've seen a, uh, a ramp strike, which is when a part of the aircraft hits before um, the landing area, which is basically the round out of the boat that is before the landing area. So they basically struck the back of the boat coming in. Yeah. Uh, it was just their hook, so it wasn't the aircraft. Um, and they were fine. That one was kind of ugly. Um, but it like rips that part of the aircraft. Absolutely. And then you land on your bellies, that kind of thing. In this particular case, it hit and then it it gave and essentially dragged the hook on the on the surface okay. after that. And so he was able to uh, grab a wire at that point. When does that kind of thing happen? Just a miscalculation by the pilot or is it uh, weather conditions? I wouldn't even call it a miscalculation. I mean, I'm gonna put the blame on the pilot because he's the only one in the cockpit, but at the end of the day, he's reacting to the situations he's dealing with. And so it may be errors or he may be doing the best with uh, you know the conditions that he's been given. On that particular one, you just got too high a rate of descent. It's very common. And that's what you see it with new pilots and you see it with older pilots, right? New ones and complacent ones. What you see is they'll um, try to make the ball go right where they want it in close. They think they can beat the game a little bit. Yeah. And they try to, and so we, we have sayings, we teach, we teach pilots, you know, as a landing signal officer, we tell them like, don't recenter the high ball in close. It's one of the rules to live by. And so when the ball's up high. <laughs> And you don't see the boat? Weather is so bad that the landing signal officer on the boat can't see you either. And oh. you can't see the boat. And you won't be able to see it when you touch down. So mm. we call that a zero, zero landing. And you turn on the taxi light so that the LSO, who has a radio in his hand that looks like a phone from 1980, yeah. um, is talking directly to the pilot. And he's looking at that little light in the rain. And he's telling him, you're high, you're low, power things like that, come right, back to left, and literally talking him down to land on the boat right there. And the pilot, usually it comes as a surprise to the pilot to landing because he's just listening to the voice, can't see the ball, can't see the boat. And all of a sudden you just hit the boat. You crash. I you mean, crash. you crash. We're yeah. going about 1,600 feet per minute descent at that point. So you're still, you're going super fast. So all of this is happening fast. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you don't know what at, at the moment it's gonna hit. So you're just going into the darkness and just waiting for it to hit. Maybe and not you, dark though. A lot of times it's white. Into the light. You're going into <laughs> into the light. The night landings as well. And I think you'll find this interesting, but I always found that the night landings where in these particular cases, you're usually lined up behind the boat, maybe 10, 15 miles. Whereas the other ones, it's like a tight circle, the landing pattern. And so we can potentially see the boat way out there um, if the lights were on, which they're not, but we can maybe see like the string of aircraft in front of us. But what's what's interesting is that it can take a while. It can take, you might be 15 miles out and your lights are turned down as dim as possible. You have a cloud deck, maybe at six or 7,000 feet so that the starlight, there's no moon, but let's say the starlight's blocked out, right? Cause just the starlight alone, no moon, you can see the boat, you can see the water. But when that goes away, it's like closing your eyes, right? You can't tell anything. 
could be upside down, uh, it could be in any position. And for me, it was almost a meditative process that I had to snap myself back out of when I was on like a long straightaway. And then I would see the light pop up in the sea of darkness, right? No lights anywhere. Can't even see the horizon. And I just see a light out there. My instruments were telling me, and they're turned down as far as they can go, right? So I can barely see them. So my eyes can adjust. And I'm just staring at this light in the distance. And it's just very meditative and it's the hum behind you. And and then at like four miles, you know, the, it almost like, oh, the light is a little bit bigger. And you almost kind of have to snap back to it and be like, oh, I need to like, kind of like, look around yeah. a little bit and yeah. re-engage my brain like back to my body and like <laughs> yeah do this because you're gonna have to actually land well is there just you said you don't necessarily feel the romantic notion of the whole thing but is there some aspects of flying where you look up and maybe you see the star the stars or um yeah that kind of thing that you just like holy crap how did humans accomplish all of this like am i actually flying right now I used to have those moments on the boat when I was catching planes land. I would, I would, they would trap and it'd be nighttime and it's just all this chaos in the middle of the ocean and nothing. And I would have these moments where I'd be like, ah. goggles and putting those on and looking up at the stars flying around, especially over the ocean. What do they look like? And uh, it's just so ocean. many. There's just so many stars that, you know, you normally can't see. They're shooting stars all the time. Almost every flight you'd see them with the goggles on. And so it was a great pleasure to take advantage of the lack of light pollution in some cases, especially on deployment, to go grab some goggles at night, go out some quiet spot in the ship that no one can see me and just kind of look around, you know? Yeah, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. Quick break, bathroom break. Yeah, I wouldn't mind a quick, quick stretch of legs. You got a few cool patches. I do. So about. this is a VFA 11 Red Rippers patch, uh, typically uh, going actually on our arm. Uh, so this is actually what we call the boar's head or Arnold. And so You apparently partied with the owner and founder of Gorn's Gin. We had a great time and there's a signed letter in our ready room that says we can use the logo in perpetuity. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I'd like to give you that patch. I drank quite a bit of gourd, so this is good. And then I'd like to give you that coin uh, from, from our squadron. <laughs> the Red Rippers, that's a badass name. <laughs> Thank you, brother. You're welcome. So let's jump around a little bit, but let me ask you about this one set of experiences that you had and people in your squadron had. So you and a few people in the squadron either detected UFOs on your instruments or saw them directly. Tell me the full story of these UFO sightings and uh, to the smallest technical details, because I love those. <laughs> I'll do my best. So we returned from, and when I say we, I mean my not my squadron, but VFA-11, the Red Rippers. Uh, I was a a somewhat junior pilot at the time. I joined them on deployment in 2012, where they had been already out there for about six months or so, um, operating in the vicinity of Afghanistan. Uh, I joined them and then we, we flew back and still as a, a relatively new guy, we came back and we entered uh, what's considered a maintenance phase where... <music> number uh, was plumbed uh, for the particular things that were needed to upgrade the radar from what's known as the APG-73 to the APG-79. And the APG-73 is a mechanically uh, scanned array radar. Uh, it's a, you know, perfectly fine radar, but the AESA radar is kind of a, you know, magnitude jump in capability, kind of a, an analog digital kind of mindset. So. Got it, so it's a leap to digital. Uh, ABG 73, 79, are these things on a, a carrier? Like, what are we talking about here? This is How our- How big is the radar? Yeah, so this is actually the radar, it's in the F-18 itself. Okay, so when you say they were chosen, this is to test uh, the upgrade to the new, the 79, ABG 79. Less of a uh, test and more of just, hey, it's your turn to get the upgrade. Like we're all going to these better radars. Um, they were building ones off the off the line with the new radar. 
in the and we call the fleet replacement squadron, essentially the training ground for the F-18, you have all sorts of F-18s with different radars. So um, you are used to having multiple ones, but in the actual deployable co combat squadron, um, we upgraded. And when we upgraded, we saw that there were objects on the radar that we were seeing the next day in in this with this new radar that weren't there with the old radar. And these were sometimes, you know, the same day, you might go on two flights, the one in the morning might be with the older radar, the one in the evening with the new radar. And you and you'd see the objects with the with the new radar. And that's not overly surprising in some sense. Uh, they are more sensitive. Uh, perhaps they're not filtering out everything they should be yet, or perhaps there's some other type of error. Uh, maybe it needs to be calibrated, whatever. It, it was relatively new and we were somewhat used to there being software problems with these types of things occasionally, just like anything else. And so, okay, maybe this is a, a radar software malfunction. We're getting some false tracks as we call them. Um, what were you seeing? And so what we would see are representations of the object. So this is off of our radar. We're not seeing a visual image here. This is kind of like a what's being displayed to us almost like in a gaming fashion, right? Like our the icon, right? So the icon is showing us, that, hey, something is there and here's the parameters I can understand about it. So this is in the cockpit, there's a display that's showing um, some visualization of what the radar is detecting. Correct. And there's two different ways to do that. The first one is like the actual data, like the, the radar where, um, I am, it's showing me the data kind of as if it's in front of me and I'm selecting those contacts. And there's another screen called the situational awareness page. And that's kind of a God's eye view that brings all that data into one spot. And so, uh, I'm going to talk about this from the SA page, from the situational awareness page versus the individual radar ones, cause it's easier, but. Can you, so, sorry, sorry to linger on that. <laughs> Radar displays I talked about are at the bottom of that display is kind of representative of where I am. And so I see Got what's it. in front of me. Got it. Whereas the situational awareness page, uh, the aircraft is located in the center of that. And then I, all around me, you know, based off of the data link and wherever I'm getting information from, uh, I can see that whole where page. I can see all the situation. So um, I'm gonna kind of talk about this from the situational awareness page, which is a top-down view, just to kind of frame our minds instead of jumping around. And so what we would see out there is we'd see these indications that something would be there and they would have a track file. That track file, that thing that represents the object has a line coming out of it. And that represents, it's called the target aspect indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some tracking from the radar. Correct, so it's showing you where the object's going. This is all pretty cool that the radar can do all this. So radar locks in on d different objects and attracts them over time. Correct. That's coming from the radar. That, that's like built-in feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's out there, we're seeing it. It's, we don't have to necessarily like pull things into our, our tracker in some sense, right? Like it's all out there and then we... And you see them turn, right? Like it's not magic. But this object, they would, the target aspect would kind of be like all over the place, like kind of randomly in the 360 degrees, you know, from that top down view, mm -hmm. that line would be in any place. So kind of, you know, is it unable to determine the, tar the target aspect? Is it stationary, you know, and that's just how it puts it out and it's not used to seeing it. So I'm not saying that's necessarily super weird, but it was different than what we were used to seeing because we weren't used to seeing stationary objects out there very much. Um, and what was also interesting is that these weren't just stationary on a zero wind day, right? These are stationary at 20,000 feet, 15,000 feet, 500 feet, you know, with, with the wind blowing, you know? <laughs> and so much like the sea, you know, when we're up there fighting, it affects everything. We consider the wind when we're, you know, shooting missiles, when we're flying or fuel considerations, it's like operating, you know, in that volume of air, like the ocean, everything's going with the current. And so anything that doesn't go with the current, you know, is immediately, kind of identifiable and strange. And that's why these were initially strange is because they would be stationary against the wind. So if you had something like a good drone in the windy conditions, what would that look like? Would it, it would it not come off as stationary? Would it sort of float about kind of thing? No, I think with the drone technology we have today, they could stay within it. 
Interesting. Um, so it could look very stationary. Uh, but that wasn't necessarily, you know, and what's interesting about this story is that there's not like the one smoking gun, right? You have to kind of look at everything. And that's what, you know, I don't like about um, the Department of Defense and just generally people's take on this is that everything is kind of based around a single image, you know, or that, that one case. But a lot of the interestingness comes from the duration or the time it's been out there, how they're interacting relative to other objects out there. And you don't get that information when you just look at a frame for a second, you know, everyone kind of bites off on the shiny object, but. So you yourself, from your particular slice of things you've experienced and seen directly or ind indirectly, you've kind of built up an intuition about what are the things that were being seen. I wouldn't go that far. I've just been able to, you know, eliminate some some variables because of how long I've observed it. So like you said, yes, can a drone stay in a particular position against the wind like that? Certainly. But I don't think it can do that and then go 0.8 Mach for four hours after that, you know? And so when you when you look at it outside of that one, that moment in time, then it eliminates a lot of the potential things it could be, at least from my perspective. So what kind of stuff did you see? Yeah. in the instruments? We'd see them flying um, in patterns, uh, kind of racetrack patterns or circular patterns, or just going kind of straight east. Um, I occasionally see them supersonic, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, but typically 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 Mach, just for extremely extended periods of time, you know, essentially all the time. <laughs> and this is... Air going to tell us about it so um incursions happen not a big deal but um it, they're pretty rare honestly because everyone knows the area and we've been operating there for decades and what are the trajectories at 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 mark that these objects were taking typically they would be in some type of circular pattern or kind of racetrack pattern when they were at those speeds or i just see them kind of and it wasn't always like a mechanical flight description. And when I say that, I mean like an autopilot is going to be just very precise, right? It's going to be locked on straight. And whereas I could see an airplane, I could tell if the pilot's flying it, right? Because it's not going to be perfect. Hmm. The computer's not controlling it. And these seemed more like that. Not that they were imprecise, but that they were even much more erratic than that. So like, it wasn't like a straight line in a turn. It was just kind of like a you know, a weird drift like that in that direction, you know? So it wasn't controlled by a dumb computer or uh, not, not disrespect to computers. <laughs> so it wasn't controlled by autopilot kind of technology. That's not the sense that I got. Yeah. So how many people have seen them in the squadron? Uh, sort of how many times were they seen? How many? Uh, pod, uh, it's essentially a infrared camera that we use for targeting mostly in the air to surface environment. We don't use it in the air to air arena. It's just not that good of a tool, uh, frankly. But um, we would see IR energy emitting from that location where the radar was dropping us off. So, we, you know, the radar, we'd lock onto the object and our sensors would all look there. And so then we could see. People would want to go see what they look like, right? So people would try to fly by. I try to fly by him. I like how that's an of course. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, you don't want to fly by it. Certainly. You know, I, d d d there's an uh, there's a argument against that kind of perspective that maybe the thing is dangerous, so maybe we don't. But perhaps that's part of the reason. You want to... Also aware of you know potential intelligence gathering operations that could be going on. We're up there flying our tactics. We're emitting. Uh, we're practicing our EW. You know. We're turning at particular times. Like there's stuff that can be learned. It's not a secret. And you know, countries keep different fishing vessels and whatnot in international waters off there. So it's not exactly a secret that uh, we're being observed out there. So to think that a foreign hostile or a foreign nation would want to, um, you know, somehow intercept information, whether that's um, our radar signals or our jamming capabilities, to try to um, break that down or understand it better, be ready for that next fight. Um, I mean, that's what that's what scares me about this scenario because we didn't jump right to aliens or UFOs. We thought, you know, this is a radar malfunction we need to be aware of, it's a safety issue. And then 
you know, this could be a, a, a tactical problem right here because everything we do is based off a, a crypto and and locate you know locations everything's classified we do out there right and so over time if you gather enough data about those fights and just monitor them forever just like uh some nations uh do with other uh pieces of technology or software um they could probably learn a lot and so we have to be cognizant of the fact and defend against it so what can you say about the other characteristics of these objects like shape size, texture, luminosity, how else do you describe object? Is there something that could be said? So you said like this detect down radar, step one, now you have FLIR images that can give you a sense that it's actually a physical object. What else can be said about those mm -hmm. physical objects? So eventually someone did see one with their own eyeballs, um, multiple people, and it, and they saw it in a somewhat interesting way. Um, the object presented itself at the exact altitude and geographic location of the entry point. It was. Um, was it that were they just not there and were being fooled? Was something happening? Were they were they moving, dropping altitude the last minute? You know, we're we're going by pretty quick, so it's difficult to tell. Um, but perhaps if his radar wasn't working, he wasn't receiving energy from the jet. And the jet, of course, didn't know that he was there. And so it, whatever the case was, they flew right by and they described it just as a dark gray or, or black cube um, inside a clear translucent sphere. And the kind of the apex of the little cube were touching the inside of that sphere. That's an image that's haunting. So what do they think it is? What did they think at that moment uh, that they, is it just this kind of cloud of uncertainty that, that they're just describing a geometric object? It's not on radar, so it's unclear what it is. Um, yeah, what was uh, the, any kind of other description they've had of it in terms of the intuition from a pilot's perspective? You know, you have to kind of identify what a thing is. Mm -hmm. To answer the first part, they they actually canceled the flight and came back because they were, you know, it's like if there's one of these out here and we're almost hitting them and it's right there, then um, um, and that's actually when we started submitting hazard reports or hazreps to the naval through the naval aviation safety um, kind of communication network and it's it's you know it's not like a, a big proactive thing where people can go investigate it's more of a data collection mechanism so that you can kind of share that aggregate data and make sure things are uh, progressing um, so it wasn't a mechanism that would result in action being taken but we were hoping to at least get the message out to whomever was maybe running a classified program that we were not aware of or something like that that hey like you could kill somebody here like you've you've grown too big for your britches here take a step back um, so that was that was our concern at that point. That's kind of where we were thinking this was going. What's the protocol for shooting at a thing? Hmm. Was was uh, was there a concern that it's a direct threat, not just surveillance, but a thing that could be, yeah, a threat? Yeah. At least from my perspective, like that never really crossed into my mind. I thought it was potentially an intelligence, um, you know, failure that we could be being watched and information gathered. Uh, but I didn't think that it was something that would proactively engage me in a hostile manner. It wouldn't really make sense either, too. It, it would be shocking to like have one of these objects take out an F-18, but there's no real tactical advantage other than fear, perhaps. Uh, Psychological. Yeah. I've learned a lot about the psychological warfare in Ukraine. This yeah. is a big part of the war. Um, it didn't seem, it didn't fit your conception of a threatening entity. Correct. So looking back now from the, all the pieces of data you've integrated, you've personally added, what do, what do you think it could be? I don't know. Putting the wrong piece of sky or 
you know, perhaps was developed and tested in an inappropriate spot by someone that uh, wasn't obeying best practices. Is but, there, uh, sorry to interrupt, is there a sort of uh, modularity to the way the, the military operates to where it's possible for one branch not to know about the tests of another? Yeah, it, I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that that could occur, right? And so if we just make that assumption, we can integrate that into our analysis here and just say, okay, but at the point we're at now, you know, we have to assume that that's not the case, right? With everything that's been going on and the statements have been made and the hearings, I think that if it was a, a, a non-communication issue, um, we're in big trouble at this point. What about it being an object from uh, another nation, from China, from Russia? Or even one of our allies, perhaps, right? Maybe allies. that's, an, you know, I don't think it's um, controversial to say that our adult allies could be gathering information about us or anything of that nature, but that would be an extreme case. But I think it's just important to say, right, to not just say Russia or China and just call them the bad guys and assume that if they don't have it, no one can do it. Um, and the behaviors that have been seen, it would be, I would expect to see remnants of that technology elsewhere in the economy. There seems to be too many things that require advanced technology that would be beneficial commercially as well as in other military applications for it to be completely locked away by one of our competitors. Now, I could see us perhaps locking something away if we're already in the lead and having it to pull out as needed. But for someone that's perhaps in a power struggle and they're in second place, they might be more aggressive with the development of different types of technology willing to accept bigger risks. Do you think it could be natural phenomena that we don't yet understand? I think that there are a number of things that this is... ...spoken about. So we'll talk about that as well. I'd just love to get your... Um your sort of uh, interpretation of those incidents. But yeah, so in this particular case, natural phenomena could be a part of the picture, but you're saying not the whole picture. Yes, yes, and we can't discount it. Oh, the other thing is, what about the failure of pilot eyesight? Like sort of some deep mixture of actual direct vision human vision system failure and like right but i've explored them to see if they could have some truth and one example is let's imagine a scenario where if we're seeing these objects every day off the east coast i can imagine a technology or an operation where you had some type of traditional propulsion system operating drones in order to gather data like we had discussed and I could, I could envision a clever enough adversary that could perhaps destroy or somehow remove these objects and replace them with new objects essentially when we're not looking, right? And that accounts for the large uh, airborne time. And so I, I explore options like that and I try to see, you know, what, what evidence and assumptions need to be made in order to prove or disprove that. And, you know, you would need so much infrastructure. You know, you need so you need so many assets, and so I try to explore some of those fallacies and some of those concerns. And as aviators, we're trained into many uh, like actual physical, like eyesight and kind of illusion uh, training. So, like at nighttime flying, there's so many things that can happen flying with false horizons, and so we receive hours of of training on that type of of stuff. But this just falls outside the category from my perspective. What was the visibility condition? In a world that's full of mystery, I have to ask, what do you think is the possibility that it's not of this earth origin? Mm -hmm. I like the term non-human intelligence in a sense. Because again, there's, so much, there's a lot of assumptions in there that may cause us to go down the wrong roads. It could, you know, these could be something that are weather phenomena of Earth, right? Or something else that is just something we don't understand and can't imagine right now that's still of this Earth. Um, if we consider 
extraterrestrials or something that came from a, a physical place far away in space time, um, you know, that leads us to some detection assumptions that we would need to make. And so I just try to not categorize it under anything and just say, hey, is this demonstrating intelligence? And start from there as a single object. What can we learn about it kinematically, how it's performing? What does that mean for its energy source? What does that mean for the G-forces inside? Uh, and then step it out a level and say, okay, how are these interacting with our fighters, if they are? How are they interacting with the weather and their environment? How are they interacting with each other? So can we look at these and how they're interacting perhaps as a swarm, uh, especially off the East Coast where this is happening all the time with multiple objects, right? And so we might be able to determine some things about their maybe, you know, sensor capabilities or the areas of focus, you know, if we can determine uh, how they're working in conjunction with each other. But, you know, seeing one little flash of an object uh, doesn't provide that type of insight. Um, but we have the systems for it, but, and, and it's kind of, I mean, not irony, but it's it's a fact of life, the reality that many of these well-deployed, highly capable systems are held under the military umbrella, which makes it difficult to provide that data for scientific analysis. So there's probably a lot more data on these objects that's not being that's not made available, probably even within the military for analysis. I think that if or when that data is available or that there's additional analysis needed, you know, we can spin up those teams and make that analysis. So there was a recently a House Intelligence Subcommittee hearing on UFOs that you were a part of. What was the goal of that hearing? And can you maybe summarize what you heard? The hearings, from my perspective, uh, seemed a bit disingenuous, uh, kind of top level. Uh, I think... Um, who was it run by? Sorry to interrupt. Like, who were the people involved and what was the goal, the stated goal? Congressman Andre Carson uh, did chair the committee and he, he was, I think, ultimately responsible for bringing it all together. Science for no reason. Um, so I... I applaud and I encourage their efforts on the intelligence side to help understand this. Um, but my concern is that they uh, play a role they're not well suited for, which is is doing science. And the Pentagon has opened a new office to investigate UFOs called All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. What do you think about this office? Do you think it can help alleviate in the, in the way which this hearing perhaps has failed to improve more the scientific rigor and the seriousness of investigating UFOs? I think that remains to be seen. I think it's a step in the right direction, but it's a step that was taken because the previous step didn't happen, <laughs> right? So uh, the AOI MSG was the progeny essentially of the AARO or AERO. And you know the name was changed because the Um, the Airborne Object Identification Synchronization Management Group. <laughs> Quite the mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, I practice that. Uh, <laughs> but the new All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, you know, from my perspective, at least, at least the perspective that they're putting out, they they seem to want to be open. They put out uh, a Twitter handle. They're out, they're going out on Twitter and communicating, saying they want to keep this open. Um, but you know, that's going to run into a classification wall. Well, so uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick is, seems like an interesting guy. He does, yes. <laughs> so he, he's got a, um, I haven't looked in too deeply, but he, he seems to have sort of, he's coming from like a science research perspective, like a uh, uh, background. Mm -hmm. So he, he might be at least in the right um mindset the right background to kind of lead a serious investigation i think so i'll just say generally um you know the office has been receptive to ai delay reaching out in order to collaborate uh, which has been uh, a positive sign um also pass the same kudos to um, dr spurgle and nasa's uh effort as well I, I i see these organizations that are standing up i, I do see them as as good faith efforts that are coming about through a lot of 
difficulty and negotiation most likely, right? And I see these as as a small uh, door opening that if we can take advantage of can lead to uh, a much more productive relationship between these organizations. How do you put pressure on this kind of thing? Does it come from the civilian leadership? Does it come from sort of Congress and presidents? Does it come from the public? Does the public have any power to put pressure on this? Or is the, the the giant wall of bureaucracy going to protect it against any public pressure? What do you think? I think we've been in, in that latter state for a while, but, you know, society seems to be a bit different nowadays. You know, we have the ability to communicate and to group and to, to form relationships in a way that hadn't been able to be present in the past. We've been able to do research for better or worse on our own, you know, in a way that hasn't been able to happen before. And so I sense that people are a bit less willing to kind of buy the bottom line statement from those in power as they used to be back when they didn't have access to those tools. And so I do think there is a massive role for the general society, general populace to play to show that they are interested in this. Because it's not that I don't think the politicians or the leaders in the in the Pentagon, it's not that they don't like this topic necessarily or think it's toxic per se, but they exist in a culture where this has been toxic and they don't feel comfortable talking about it. And these are people that have spent their entire careers, you know, working towards a goal and getting to very high positions within government. And so this is very against their nature to take a stance on a topic like this. Um, and so the fact that these are standing up even if they do have a small budget or if they struggled a bit at first, I still think it's a massive change, you know, and it's a big step away from that stigma that has been pervading this topic for so long. And you're actually part of alleviating these things. That's a big risk that you took, but it's extremely valuable because it's uh, alleviating the stigma. I thank you for saying that, but it didn't feel like much of a risk for me. Uh, you know, I didn't come out about aliens, right? I or whatever. I I had a safety problem that I started asking questions about, and you know, I went down a road as a Navy trained aviation safety officer, right? That sent me to school for six weeks in Pensacola to be a safety officer. You know, we're almost hitting these objects, and it's not something that happened in the past, and we want to understand it. It's happening right now, like yeah. these. These occurrences are still happening. Aviators are flying right now, are still flying by these things. And in fact, um, I mentioned I was an instructor pilot. Um, I had a student call me uh, about eight months ago or so. And he's like, hey, sir, you know, I made it to the fleet finally. Uh, you know, I had trained him how to fly. And then he goes to F-18, he goes another year of training, and then he gets out to his squadron on the East Coast. And he's flying with a senior member of uh, the base, NAS Oceana, where the fighters fly out of um, senior 05 or 06. And it was kind of a bad weather day. And so they said, hey, you know, if the weather's not good enough for us to do this dogfighting set, we'll, we'll go out and do a, a UAP hunt, you know, see if we can't find any things or take a look at them, you know. I don't know if it was in jest or not, but, you know, this, they, I actually would say it's not just because there were, there were notices that were being briefed about this being a safety hazard at this point. And so I, now that I, I think about it, it likely wasn't just long story short, they went flying. The weather was too bad. They did go on a UFO hunt and they physically saw one, you know, and he called me up and said, like, Hey, sir, I saw a cube and a spear. They're still out here, you know, years later. And so it's almost like a generational issue, you know, for these fighter pilots, at least on these coast. But that's great that they can talk about it, right? Exactly, exactly. They feel at least comfortable. They have a reporting mechanism. And so that was one of the problems that I noticed that we have a lot of reporting mechanisms to take care of safety issues and, and even tactical issues when the time's right in order to keep track of what's going on. If I could ask your sort of... Uh take your opinion of the different uh, UFO sightings uh, that the DOD has released videos on. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the Tic Tac UFO that uh, David Fravor and others have cited? To disbelieve anything he says. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but in terms of the actual UFO, 
Is there something anomalous and interesting to you about that particular case? Maybe um, one interesting aspect there is how much do I understand about the um, water surface and underwater aspects of these UFOs? It seems like a lot of the discussions about is about the movement of a, this particular thing that seems to be weird, anomalous, seems to defy physics. But what about stuff that's happening underwater? That's interesting to me. If I had advanced technology, I would certainly like to operate in part underwater because you can hide a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. You think it would be somewhat as easy as traveling through interstellar space, at least. Or... Cross-domain tracking, right? I can't mm -hmm. see something go underwater and then follow it underwater. So it's literally not your domain, like underwater, yeah. like leave that for somebody else. But yeah, and you know, I, I, I use that terminology because it's, it's kind of important, right? Um, Cross-domain tracking uh, is something that we haven't had to necessarily worry about, right? Because right. airplanes operated in the air and submarines <laughs> yes. operated underwater and space planes operated in space, right? But, you know, there's going to be, you know, that's going to blur, I think, as, as we move along here, especially in the air and space regime. Uh, and being able to perhaps transition my radar contact at, 40,000 feet to another radar system that can track it up to 200,000 feet, you know, that might be a value. And so we, we seem to be missing that right now. So what about the go fast and the gimbal videos that you mentioned earlier? Well, there was a, like, what's interesting there to you? So the gimbal, I'll talk about that one first. I was airborne for that one. Um, the person that recorded it uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, but I mean, both their crew, I knew both of them, but the, the wizard himself, uh, very close friends with, went through a lot of our training together. Uh, we went to the same fleet squadron. Uh, he ended up transitioning to be a pilot and then came to where I was instructing. So I got to instruct him a bit on his transition. Um, and you know, the way that was, was, was we went out on a... So we're, we're kind of practicing like we play. And so he saw these objects on the radar, um, the gimbal and a, a fleet of other aircraft or vehicles. And they initially thought it was um, part of the training exercise that they were sending something in to, to try to penetrate the airspace. Um, and so they, you know, they flew over to it. And as they got close enough to get it on the FLIR, um, you know, I think everyone has heard the reaction um, and they realized that it wasn't something they were expecting to see. Can you actually describe what's in the video and what's the re reaction in case they haven't seen it? Yeah, a lot of swearing. Uh, but so what you see <laughs> on the FLIR footage is a black or white, depending on when you look at it, object that's somewhat shaped like a gimbal. It, it appears almost as if someone put two plates together and then there seems to be almost like a small funnel of IR energy that's at the top of the bottom of those plates in a sense. So almost as if, you know, there's a stick going in between two plates, but not that pronounced, right? So there's an energy field that kind of went to a funnel on the top and the bottom. At least that's how it's being portrayed. On it's coming out of the exhaust, especially at those ranges. Um, but And there was no flames or th there's no exhaust here? There was no exhaust. There was no, you know, there was no out outgassing a propellant in any manner, right? It was just an object that had nothing emitting from it that was stationary in the sky. Well, not stationary, but it was it was um, moving along a path, right? It wasn't falling out of the sky. And it continued along, if we were to consider it from a, a God's eye view, again, on the SA page, it continued along in a path. And from the perspective, that top-down view, it just went in the other direction. So no, um, just an instantaneous direction change from that perspective. You also hear them, you know, very excitedly talking on the tapes about, um, you know, whatever the heck this thing is and look at the essay. In a like autopilot type manner where it was very stiff. It was very kind of non-mechanical, the flight mechanics mm -hmm. again. And these objects were in that formation and they were going along and then they turned pretty sharply, but they still had a radius of turn and then went back in the opposite direction. And during that turn, it was, they were kind of like all over the place. Like it wasn't tight. They weren't even like super, I, they weren't flying in a way I would expect them to be flying in relation to a flight lead. Mm 
they were flying as if they were flying close to each other, but not in formation, which was kind of strange, right? Um, and then when they rolled out, they kind of tightened back up. Like, so when they basically, they started that turn and then 180 degrees out, essentially they started flowing in the opposite direction and kind of got back in that formation. And while that was happening, the gimbal object was proceeding, was it left or right? And as, as those... <laughs> it was a is a gimbal mm -hmm. um i've come to learn after some you know having seen some research online and and people really looking into this that uh it seemed that the object actually climbed during that maneuver and so the reason it looked like it turned immediately is because it turned like this it turned uh in a vertical fashion like that which was pretty interesting that's kind of like another example of a flight mechanics that we don't normally operate because we don't change our directions by maneuvering in the vertical if we can help it it's you're just killing the fuel you know and so the, if you're like a surveillance platform looking to spend as much time around something you're not gonna you know climb 500 feet every time you make a turn unless you're tom cruise unless you're tom cruise naturally Okay, so is that one of the more impressive flight mechanics you've seen in in the video in video form? So not the direct eyesight reports, but like in terms of video evidence that we have. I think so. We we were seeing a lot of these, but we weren't just going on recording them all day. We we just kind of put them in that safety bucket. Be like, all right, there's objects over there. We're just not going to go near it, you know. And so we weren't putting our sensors on them that much. So we, we were gathering the data kind of secondarily, but we weren't primarily focusing on it to see all the details. So that's so fascinating because you have a busy day, you have a lot to do. All right, well, there's some weird stuff going on there. We're just not going to go there, and that says something about sort of the um, about human nature, about the the way that bureaucracies function, the way the military functions. It fills up your day with busy, important things, and you don't get to. Um, I mean, that is something that I'm in a sort of absurd way worry about, which is like we fill our days with so much busyness that when truly beautiful things happen, whatever they are, truly anomalous things, we just won't pay attention because they don't fit our busy schedule. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think that's right on the nose. And it's on my nose because, you know, I didn't give this topic the attention it deserved until I left, right? Until I left and I went to be an instructor pilot where I had more time, you know, I had more downtime to kind of process and think and get out of exactly what you just described. The role of Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Intelligence Program, ATIP, from your perspective, from what you know, maybe your intuition, is ATIP a real thing that existed? I was in a position as an aviator that never would have exposed me to anything like that. But I was curious about what people knew. And I I think in my mind, maybe you hoped or, you know, hope someone was looking into this in some sense. But on the day that Gimbal was recorded, I heard that they caught something extra interesting on the FLIR. And I went to the Intel debrief space um, to go see the, the film. And, you know, everyone's gathered around watching it, very interesting. Well, two parts to his approach. One, uh, I commend him for all the good work and effort he put into it. Um, he, I've seen him build some models and things of that nature. Um, and so I think that's something that's absolutely needed in this environment. No one's asking anyone to believe anyone here, right? Uh, Trust but verify uh, should certainly be the mantra. Uh, but where I have, uh, you know, a dis process for the past X years, right? <laughs> it's been a, it's been a, like a, a very safe business to be in to tell people that they haven't seen aliens. But uh, times have changed a little bit, and the tactics I've seen to try to retain that view on reality. Um, has included things such as completely dismissing what the air crew are saying. Um, and I think that is a fallacy to think that we have to take the human outside of that analysis. So those are the two things I disagree with. When you uh, put the night vision on and you look at the stars and you look out there 
in in the vast cosmos. Recognize or can really understand. I I spend so much time thinking about how we anthropomorphize things on this. This is the technology. So if you were to think, to imagine from an alien perspective, what kind of technologies would we first encounter as human beings if we were to meet another alien civilization in the next few centuries? What kind of thing would we see? So you're now at the cutting edge and you see the quick progress that's happening, that was happening throughout the 20th century, that's happening now with greater degrees of autonomy, with robots and that kind of stuff. What do you think we will encounter? I think we're gonna see uh, the ability to manipulate matter like we used to manipulate information. Like I think that's what, um, whether that means being able to pop something on the table that didn't exist or to influence a chemical reaction somewhere, but being able to manipulate and treat matter as if it was information. And so being able to design specific materials, being able to um, move past a lot of the barriers that seem to limit our progress with things such as miniaturized fusion or even just fusion in general is, you know, a lot of it is, is matter based is material based and our ability to not, um, manipulate, we can only discover materials in a sense. And so I think that a complete mastery of the f of physical reality would be one of the key traits of a, a very intelligent species. Well, you're actually working on some, maybe you can correct me, but sort of quantum mechanical simulation to understand materials. So is that, do you see sort of the, the early steps that we're doing on quantum computing side to start to simulate? Uh, it requires a massive amount of computational resources, so much so that it can't be done in a lot of cases with classical computers. And that's where quantum computers come in. Uh, study matter at a very fundamental level and unleashing artificial intelligence and machine learning on that problem, uh, I think is, you know, in a sense, you know, alien in a way that we're able to advance our science using, you know, a process that we may not fully understand with a perhaps a non-human based intelligence in some sense. And so we may find patterns in the the processes, right? How does our machine learning output, you know, can we, can we match behaviors with um, what we're observing with what maybe a machine learning algorithm with output, right? Can we try to classify the intelligence in that manner, perhaps? Um, and so, you know, at GenMaz, we're looking at these materials. And we're, we're considering what these algorithms could have used for later on. Um, could we perhaps reverse the process and determine what a unique or anomalous material, what type of properties it, it potentially could have? And you said GenMat, right? Mm-hmm. What's, uh, what is GenMat? GenMat is a couple of verticals. Uh, one of them is our quantum chemistry work. We're essentially, we're bridging the gap between essentially physics and chemistry. Uh, we're working uh, on those problems and, and again, implementing artificial intelligence machine learning into that process so that we can design those materials from the ground up. Uh, additionally, um, we are what we would consider a vertically integrated material science company, which means we can generate our, our own data. And so um, within the next quarter coming up, um, we, we are launching a satellite in the space uh, that will have a, a, a fairly advanced hyperspectral sensor in there, which is intended to be the first launch uh, that will help us um, detect different types of material. <music> of quantum mechanical simulation for materials. Mm -hmm. So to understand materials, yep. it's uh, it's really, really, really interesting. Um, so <laughs> manipulate matter, huh? I would say the next thing is forces, right? Or maybe fields. So, um, you know, manipulating or managing gravity. Um, can we, you know, uh, maneuver within fields in some manner that allows us to, um, perhaps move propellantless or in other manners, right? And so I think essentially having a deeper understanding of, um, you know, different fields and being able to interact with them 
uh, I think would be, you know, a potential avenue for, you know, travel, advanced travel, right? Um, propellerless travel. Um, can we, can we quantum entangle gravity? The reason why it would be very important and very powerful to put a human on Mars is not necessarily for the exploration facet, but in all the different technologies that come from that. So the, in putting our, there's something about putting humans in extreme conditions where we figure out how to make it less extreme, more comfortable. And uh, for that, we invent things like uh, the DOD sort of helping invent the internet and all the different technologies we've invented. It's almost like an indirect consequence of solving difficult problems, whether that problem means winning wars. <music> Like, what did my heart tell me? My heart tells me something's going on, but I have no evidence for that. Maybe that's me wanting something to go on. Maybe that's a human feeling to want to know that my government's in control of what some strange unknown thing is. Um, What's your sense if such a thing happened? Would, uh, would this kind of information leak? Would this kind of information be released by the government? I mean, that's the worry that you have is because when you don't understand a thing and it's novel, you you want to hide it so that uh, some kind of enemy doesn't get access to it and use it against you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that is the underlying assumption. I it's a it's the one people always jump to that it's for to you know to maintain secrecy of technology, and I assume that's part of it. I wonder if there's any other reasons that we would want to not talk about it. I imagine that in such information would have a shock to the you know, social economic system of any country, if not the world. Uh, and so I wonder if perhaps that was part of the concern as well, You know, how society can react to it. Maybe we're anti-fragile enough now with everything that's going on and with our communication networks that, um, you know, why not now? I don't know, but it's uh, that's something I think about as well. Yeah, the effect on the, the mass psyche uh, of, of something like that. Together, we can typically do things that are more impressive and better than if a single person works alone. And now I know that... War I wonder, you know if we truly think about an advanced society that has been perhaps thousands or millions of years ahead of us, I would imagine that same same truth to be there, that people working together, creatures working together is a good thing for society or its society as a whole. And if we consider that as we imagine a society growing and expanding, in a sense, the ultimate... live under and we think in but if a, a planet has a, a single unit and it almost is as an entity itself at a certain level right if everything's working towards the same output you know i could almost imagine an intelligent species that approached us planet to planet instead of person to person because that's how they've evolved and they've assumed any intelligent species would understand that working together is, is better than not um, and so you know my heart tells me that at a certain point um, you know, love and caring and the desire to work together is much more powerful than, you know, the technological progress that war would bring. I hope so as well. Well, let me jump to the AI topic that you've done. So you've done research and development efforts focused on multi-agent intelligence for collaborative autonomy, machine learning AI stuff that we've been talking about for... <music> allow a machine learning to help you better understand the technology um, that you need to build in order to defeat a particular scenario, right? And I'm talking hardware now, not just the tactic itself. Um, and, you know, being able to use large amounts of simulation and machine learning to build individual assets that are small boutique using advanced manufacturing t techniques for a mission or for a particular battle, right? Instead of just having these large things against an enemy, you're building systems and technology for individual cases. 
what about manned and unmanned teaming? So uh, man and machine working together. Mm -hmm. Is there interesting ideas there? I approach it from the um, position that the human should be commanding from the highest level possible, right? So mission objective based targeting. And so if, just for an example, if there's a building here and I want that building to go away, that's the message I wanna communicate. I don't wanna tell certain vehicles to be in a certain spot. I don't wanna know how much fuel they have. I don't even wanna know what capabilities they have necessarily. I just wanna know that I have the ability to select from a cloud of capabilities. Or the, the human mind is it's able to do some of these strategic calculations, but also ethical calculations, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. That's what humans are good at. Does it worry you a future where we have increasingly higher autonomy in our weapon systems, in our war? So you said building. What about all the terrorists in the city? Mm -hmm. So you said multiple buildings region, that kind of, it's a greater and greater um, autonomy. Mm -hmm. So that that's a fear, right? Um, you're viewing it from a, we can cover more perspective, which is um, fair and a lot of, we, we I, I don't approach it from that topic, at least I don't think of it that way, at least morally. Um, I think that with the advancement of warfare, assuming we have a just and, and moral leadership, uh, if that's the case. But, you know, I've seen truck bombs go off on school buses, you know, driving around Afghanistan uh, while escorting convoys. And, you know, it wasn't easy then, and I'm sure it's not any easier now, especially after what you've just seen. Do you have thoughts about the current war in Ukraine, maybe from a military perspective, maybe from the Air Force perspective? So I could just mention a few things. There's the uh, Bayraktar drones that are being used. Uh, they're unmanned. I think they have capability to be autonomous, but they're usually remotely, remotely controlled. They're used for reconnaissance. But <laughs> down low, spitting flares out, getting shot down. It's, you know, it's incredible to, to see this happening, you know, live for everyone to see. Um, so that's just kind of a quick meta comment. But as far as the actual, you know, I, I think these small form factor UAVs where they're just like strapping weapon to it and flying over and trying to drop it at the right time or any of this, these type of commercial applications of technology into this ad hoc warfare area is incredibly interesting because it shows, you know, how useful that technology can be outside of the military, right? Like these, like, especially like DJI, right? Like there's obviously a lot of technology in there is being leveraged for other capabilities within, you know, the PLC military, uh, or at least we would assume. Um, what happens if that is more widespread, right? Like what if we were creating our own drones and they were being used against us? Would we want to have some type of kill switch or something like that, right? So what I think governments are gonna have to consider like all these tools that are gonna be easily available to just any person could be turned into a tool of war. How do we stop that from being turned against us? You know, especially as we look at, you know, 10 years from now when we have a large number of autonomous UAVs delivering packages and doing everything else over our country, and any one of those could be potentially a weapon if we don't have the proper security. Well, there's, we're now in Texas, and uh, Texas values its guns and it sees guns as, among other things, a protector of individual freedom. And you could see a future perhaps where, and I've certainly have experienced this in the empowering nature of this in Ukraine, where you... I mean, that one of the interesting things about the volunteer army in Ukraine is that they're basically using their own salary to buy the ammunition to fight for their independence. That's the very kind of ideal that sort of uh, people speak about when they speak about the, the Second Amendment in this country. That it's interesting to see the advanced technology version of that.
especially mm -hmm. in Ukraine, sort of using uh, computer vision technology for uh, surveillance and reconnaissance to try to um, and, and integrate that information to to discover the targets and all that kind of stuff, um, to put that in the hands of civilians. It's fascinating to see, to, to sort of fight for their independence. You could say that to fight against um, authoritarian regime of your own government, all that kind of stuff. It shows you how complicated the war space in the future is gonna be, you know, invading a land like that where people have, you know, that many different types of resources. It can <laughs> absolutely change warfare. I mean, hopefully that creates a disincentive to start war. <laughs> to go to war with a, yeah, to sort of, it changes the nature of guerrilla warfare. It does, yeah. Hey, you know, I don't think Putin was expecting to be in that engagement quite as long as he has. Well, quagmire each time due to the complications around the, the society's ability to access interesting tools. <laughs> you know, that it could be, you know, it could be a huge... Is this just a part of human nature? I think so. I think I think it is. Uh, until we until we move past resource limitation, there's always going to be at least that one particular cause of conflict, and then we can also consider all our psychological lizard brain emotions that cause us to act out. Although, you know, we're ho hopefully we have enough things in place to stop that from rising to the level of war. But, you know, we have our own biology, our own psychology and evolution to combat. Um, and then, the, but there are pragmatic reasons to exert violence sometimes, unfortunately, and that one of those cases could be resource limitations. And so while uh, your question was, do I think there'll always be war in this world? I, my unfortunate answer is perhaps yes, but once there's more than one world and we're less resource constrained, then perhaps it'll be a, a valve of sorts for that. I talked to Jocko on this podcast. And I, I, I told him. But there is good and bad in this world, according to Jocko. Mm -hmm. I hear that anger and hate when I was in Ukraine among some people where there was a sense where you they were gonna kill me if I didn't kill them. Um, but, you know, I think that environment isn't one born out of hate, you know, being in that type of scenario and, you know, since it's, how to be alive, right? I mean, that's the, our, our natural state is be fighting for our survival in a sense. And so I think there's there's great power and strength and clarity perhaps in that. And it's not always born out of, of hate, but out of necessity. And we can't always control that. And I think as we focus on ourselves so much, we only dance on that pinhead when we find ourselves fighting for things that we need. And we're always taking from someone else at this point. And so as someone that's been in combat and very high above of it, I'll say, right, where I didn't feel like I was in particular danger, um, I, I, I rationalized it and I made my wife do it knowing that there were people on the other side that were going to die that were on. This is the Lex Free Podcast.